This week, Blaine's answering your questions about the custom fuel system he built, from day tank size, to fittings, to fuel quality. A few of you asked about push-on fittings and whether he trusts them. Others want to know why he didn't just design his own tanks from scratch. And the question of the day really made Blaine stop and think. You'll see why at the end. Thanks for sending these in. Let's get to it. Hi everybody, we are three weeks away from our grand departure on the Great Siberian Sushi Run. Working feverishly trying to get a whole bunch of stuff done, uh, but it's coming up quick. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the fuel system video last week. We've got a bunch of questions. We're gonna go ahead and get into it. We've got a question from Michael Baker 5334 Why don't you design your own tanks with inspection holes and get new ones fitted? Well, all about cost. Uh, the tanks that we have, they're actually pretty good shape. Uh, they might have some stuff inside of them, but they're not bad. There's no holes. Uh, they seem to be pretty good. So if we don't have to spend the money on it, we're not gonna. Uh, so easy enough to just put inspection ports at the top and that's the plan eventually. Next up, we've got a question from Bill7437 EMTP. Curious why you're using the monster exhaust from the old engines when you could save a ton of space using smaller exhaust for the truck engines. Uh, actually, we're gonna get all into that in next week's video. Uh, it's gonna be all about the exhaust and the building of that. So stay tuned, hang in there, because we're gonna answer those questions on the next video. I've got a question from Brent McMahon, 8188. Where's your drill press? You know, Brent, I don't have one on board right now, yet. I will have one on board. The one that you saw me using in past videos, that's from my friend over at Action Welding. Uh, he was nice enough to let me use his shop for a little bit, but I don't actually have one, and at that time, I didn't have access to his shop. Uh, so, don't have one yet, gonna get one. We got a question here from Andy Guest 6543 Do you worry about diesel bug, and do you have a plan should you accidentally purchase contaminated fuel? So I'll go a little bit of background on that. Diesel bug, uh, what that is, is there's biological matter that grows in between the water layer and the fuel layer inside of the fuel tank, should you get water in your tanks. And basically it creates a mess. You get the, basically the poop from all of this biological growth in there, and it gets nasty. It creates big chunks and it can really make a, a big mess of fuel filters and pretty much everything. Um, and it's difficult to control in certain circumstances. So for us, fortunately, and I think a lot of the benefit from the boat being in cold weather is we don't get a lot of condensation in the tanks. Uh, there's not enough of a temperature differential to form that here. We don't run air conditioners, so even when it's hot, there's not a big temperature differential. I'd see like a, a boat down in the Caribbean where you have a, a warm water temp and you're running air conditioner in the boat. Uh, you're gonna get a bit of that, that condensation forming um, or vice versa. Uh, if your fuel's really cool and you're really hot out, we don't really have that much here. So it's, it hasn't been a big problem. We don't have a lot of crap in the tanks now. When we do fuel up and there is a good chance that we could get some of that in there, that's gonna go into the main tanks. There's, there's things that you can do and try to, to do. Biggest thing is taking fuel samples, but the main thing for us is just carrying lots and lots of filters. And fortunately, all of our fuel tanks, the main keel tanks, all have really big inspection ports in them. So if we get it bad enough, we can actually get in there and do some cleaning, but hopefully we won't have to have to do that. So it, basically for us, just lots of filters. Uh, and with the big capacity of the dolls for transfer filters to the day tanks, that eliminates the possibility of that crap getting into the, the feed tanks for the engines. Just want to mention, guys, we're in the final days to use this discount code to join our crew on BoardTongueRoa.com and get entered to win one of three nice travel coffee mugs. So check it out, see what you think, and we'll see you there. Next question we've got from TinGrand01. Do you have a catastrophic failure prevention kit on those CP3, CP4s? If not, if one of them self-destruct, is it going to contaminate both fuel systems? Are their returns isolated and filtered separately? Great job on the fuel system, really enjoying your videos. Thanks. Um, I do not have any sort of failure prevention kit. These are the CP3 pumps, and they're not really known for their failures. Uh, the CP4s are the ones that are pretty much associated with that whole catastrophic kill everything mess. Um, to answer the question more succinctly, no, I don't have any sort of filtration, and yes, the, the engines can be run off of the same setup, although I am gonna be 
altering some things to separate the engines from day tank to day tank so they will be isolated at some point or have the ability to be isolated. I can't say that I'll always run them that way, but that's a possibility. Got a question here from, from the prairies. Why are you working in gallons for your, for your fuel system versus liters? Well, for starters, I'm actually from the States. I was born in Louisiana. I haven't lived there since I was about 12 years old. Uh, been a long time out of the States. Um, secondly, in Canada even, where we are, we're kind of all over the place. Um, we use metric system for some things, Imperial for other things, like weight and height is feet and pounds. Um, it's just the way my mind thinks. So if you're, if you're wondering, that's just natural for me. Next question is from SlapHappyU7N. What you have not discussed is the fuel tanks as old as the boat is, your fuel would be your main problem clogging your filters. What are you going to do to solve this problem? So yes, the tanks are the original tanks that were built into the boat. Kind of hard to change that. Um, all of our tanks have access hatches and they're big. They're big enough, they're manholes. I mean, they're big enough to climb right in there. Um, and we've also had some work done on our shaft logs in past videos where we've had the tanks cut open and you can see in there. And honestly, the tanks are pretty clean. Uh, they're, they're not bad at all. Uh, the, the fabricator actually commented on it when he was welding. He's like, I'm really surprised that your tanks are as good as they are for how old the boat is. So fortunately, I don't know what the circumstances were in the boat's past, but we seem to be pretty lucky in that regard. Got a question from Steve Richardson, 6920. Obviously by doing this work, you are intimately familiar with the valving and piping on the fuel system. As a suggestion for additional work, would you consider a color coding system, e.g. use colored heat shrink on the valve handles to make identification easier for future crew members or during tense and stressful situations? I am fairly certain that Janice would really appreciate that. <laughs> so uh, that's a great idea. And honestly, yeah, I'll probably look into doing something like that because it makes a lot of sense. Next up, got a question from Zachary Taylor 4513. What do you guys have on board for heat? Well, Zachary, uh, we have a Dickinson drip heater in the main salon that heats up most of the main salon. And then we've got a ITR Chinook heater, which is a hydronic system, big unit down in the engine room that pipes hot water or cold, well, hot water throughout the rest of the boat. Um, we have videos on that in the past. So if you have a look back, go into a lot more detail on that stuff. Next question from Mr. Darcy Camp. Uh, do you have emergency fuel shutoffs? I don't know if it's required on yachts. It is on commercial vessels. We always use Raycors, dolls are similar, and toilet paper filters. Um, great question. I don't think there's any requirement for pleasure vessels or luxury vessels to have uh, emergency fuel shutoffs. I think that is a commercial only thing. Uh, but yeah, great question. We don't have them. Got a question from Horseshoe182. I always do a dummy fit up with threaded fitting. You need to check the thread cut clearances before taping. What tape did you use? Um, yeah, that's <laughs> that's a good, uh, a good comment question. Um, I did do some kind of fit ups with everything. What I ended up finding out in the end is the actual threads were bottoming in the fitting and that caused all sorts of nightmare that I still have to resolve. Um, but it just, with the bare metal to bare metal, it was really tough to tell whether or not it was bottoming or just tightening up. And uh, that caused a bit of confusion. So, yep, uh, we'll be revisiting that one. As for what tape I used, I actually don't remember the name of it. It's down in a cupboard somewhere, but it was a, a specialty tape for fuel systems. It was in a little green and or yellow and black tin, but I don't remember the name of it, sorry. <laughs> Next up, question from In Mouch. Uh, did I see a third diesel engine sitting there on the starboard side? Yes, you did. We've actually got two more diesel engines on board. One of them is functioning as a DC generator. The other is going to eventually be the AC generator. Uh, so yeah, we do have two more there waiting to go. We have a question from Walter Geisbrecht, 7116. Hopefully I said that correctly. Your wife must be a very understanding person. It looks to me like you're assembling the fuel rails sitting on the couch in the main living area of your boat. Is that accurate? Anyways, it's an interesting place to complete the task. Yes, yes on all accounts. I, I do have a very understanding wife. And yes, I was sitting in the couch in the main salon in the boat because that is the most comfortable place 
to sit in a simple fuel rail. Fortunately, we've been in a refit for years, so it's not like our living area is super spotless, uh, especially when we were in the boatyard. We had dust and dirt everywhere. Uh, so fortunately, Janice was very accommodating with that. And I got to watch a Marvel movie while doing it. Next question up is from S-H-R-D-I-N-C. Schurdink? Uh, why such a complicated manifold for day tanks? While swapping over quick seems like a good idea, I think I'd rather have one engine still turning, take time to think what caused a bad fuel in the port tank, for example, and verify it's not a failed pump or something, and just have some jumper hoses to reach the other tank if needed. I was definitely, I would definitely want a backup transfer pump plumbed in though, as if that fails on passage, I would want a quick changeover. And I think I'd want my backup just a standard 1224 volt in case multiple systems fail on a long passage. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, the main thing with the manifolds being complicated is that they're not just day tanks. Uh, we've got complete supply tanks as well that all have to be plumbed in. And the benefit with the manifolds set up that way on the supply and return for the day tanks as well is that gives me the ability to polish the fuel within each separate day tank. Um, it, it just, if I get managed to get somehow some dirty fuel in there, um, I can just pump it through that same tank, run it through, get it all clean. And it just makes more sense for me. Or I can tra transfer from one day tank to the other day tank to, to balance the boat from side to side, whichever I wanna do. So it just, it gives me a lot of options. As for the spare pump, I do have a 12 volt pump on board. Uh, it's not plumbed in yet, but it probably will be at some point. I'd also like to get a manual hand crank at some point too. I uh, would really like to have something like that if all else fails, uh, but that's in the future. We've had a couple of people ask, uh, this one was Liam Greenwood. How many liters gallons are your day tanks? Our day tanks are 200 gallons each. Uh, they seem to last for a good long time, so it's not something you have to be on top of all the time with it running out of fuel. Um, don't have any sort of an electronic sender on them that tells me data up in the pilot house, but they do have sight glasses on them. Then keep an eye on that and see where we're at. And following up that question, Fuman2108 asked, just to ask the simple question, how big are your day tanks and what is your current estimate gallons per hour of fuel usage? Uh, and for your generators. So last question, like I said, we've got 200 gallon day tanks. Uh, the fuel burn, I was estimating on this repower right around the six gallon an hour range per engine, or sorry, not per engine, uh, in total. Um, generators, I think are probably, probably gonna be around two gallons per hour when they're at full bore and full load. So, they last a while on the day tanks. We can go for quite a while before I've got to top those up. So next question is from Steve Thompson 9062. What kind of degreaser and painter are you using? Uh, we have used all sorts of different degreaser and paint on various things. Uh, hard to tell really one specific thing. I've heard bad things about some simple green stuff on boats, so we don't use that. I can't remember what it is exactly with it, but uh, we, we tend to avoid that. We've used some some degreasers from Lordco, some generic stuff. Um, yeah, really, really hard to say. We've tried a few different things to see what works best, and uh, honestly, they're all about the same. Um, as for paints, um, same thing. We've tried a few different ones. Um, we use some acrylics, we've used some standard roll-on stuff. I, I really couldn't say with any certainty what we ended up going with for most stuff. I've got another question from Mike Milburn 7823. How much faith do you have in those push-on fittings? What's the pressure rating for them blowing off? It just doesn't seem right that they don't require clamps of any kind, even something similar to a PEX type crimp. I'd be nervous that after time they'd work their way off with the pulses that are inevitable in the fluid. Honestly, those push lock fittings are, in my opinion, one of the best inventions known to man. Uh, they, I've been using them for years in the automotive industry and they are great. Uh, so pressure rating, they are rated for and rated for 300 PSI of operating pressure, which is far more than anything any of these will ever see. I think the, the most that I could ever potentially see on this would be 25 PSI. So 
never going to be an issue there. Uh, they seem to last really well too. And uh, honestly, you wouldn't think that they would, but yes, they are a phenomenal product and uh, I have no problem at all endorsing them for use in this application. Another question from Jay Kongman, 01. Uh, stupid question, but what was the final cost of the Repower and how long was it? First question, I'm not 100% sure. We haven't really sat down and looked at all the final costs. And the, the problem as well is there were so many things happening during that Repower that weren't necessarily related to the Repower itself. So it's hard to kind of pick those expenses out. Uh, we were doing bottom paint, we were doing cutlass bearings, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. So it's, it's really hard to determine just what the Repower portion of that refit cost. As for the time, we were in the yard for three months. Uh, it was a very, very long process, um, enormously time consuming for a lot of it. Wouldn't have been as bad if I had gone with like plug and play ready to go engines, but the way that I chose to do it, it was seriously time consuming. Next question is from Jeremy Judd 5236 Where can I find your other channel? Well, Jeremy, the other channel is called Exploring the World Onboard Tongaroa. So if you plug that into the YouTube search bar, it should lead you right to us. Zachary Taylor says, that's a very important thing about international boat travel. Can you get quality fuel with good cetane index in the country you're in? Absolutely. Uh, it is tough to get, and it's, I find it's less about the the quality of the actual fuel and more about what's in the fuel when you get it. Uh, a lot of places the fuel is not cared for or filtered properly and I mean I've heard stories of people getting leaves and dirt in their fuel and that's just pretty nasty stuff to get in your tanks. Uh, actually a little bit of a story uh, when we were working on board the 123 foot Palmer Johnson catch Galileo we were down in Chile and we were making an attempt to go around Cape Horn and we had picked up some pretty bad fuel and that day we were moving around a lot as well and I was changing filters just every, must have been every hour. It was terrible, terrible, terrible. Uh, fortunately we had a transfer fuel filter system on there as well and it didn't get to the engines but it was, it was nasty and it went through a lot of filters and Miserable, miserable, miserable experience. And now it's time for the comment of the day. And I say comment of the day because this time it's a comment. Uh, Blackbeard Air says, I would have staggered those ball valves with a couple inch nipples to make the handles easier accessible. Excellent idea. And I wish I had thought about that when I was doing the build on these. I'm not sure what kind of fittings I could have used because they weren't they weren't nipples that I were dealing, was dealing with. Uh, it's actually BSPP threads on the manifold side, so they were adapters. Um, so I would have had to figure out something else, maybe like a coupler with another nipple. But the point is great, and yes, it would have been a, a huge benefit in there. Uh, if you guys don't understand what he means there, is where the valves are lined up across the manifold basically just putting spacers in on every other valve so you have a staggered valve set up so they're not all right on top of each other. Uh, so yeah, that, that would have been an enormously good idea and likely I probably could have assembled the whole thing without having to disassemble each separate ball valve. Good idea. Thanks for that. And that's all the questions we had this week. Thank you to everyone who commented. We really appreciate it. If you missed a video where Blaine tore out our old fuel system and built a brand new one from scratch, now's the time to catch up. Also, don't forget to check out www.onboardtongaroa.com. We leave in three weeks for the great Siberian sushi run.